Can you hear me if I walk around like this? Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Okay. Oh. Uh, you can take the microphone. Yeah. So again, my name is Allie. I do prevention, education, and information for the DNRC here in Kalispell. I just want to say thank you, Steve, Karin, for pulling this together. This is a really timely topic um, based on the fire season that we are still having. The reason that Mike West is not here this evening is because he's the incident commander on a 40-acre fire um, just west of Foy's Lake. So Mike is not just not here, he's actually, he's working. Um, so there's a reason why, which also means that I can speak a little bit longer because I told Mike that I would speak for him this evening, um, which is great because we do work, as Steve said, really closely together under this new umbrella organization of Fire Safe Flathead. So we've got the Flathead National Forest, the DNRC, Flathead County, um, multiple homeowner associations, anybody interested in helping to create fire adapted communities in our area, you are more than welcome to join us. So again, a really timely topic, um, pairing it with the, the topic of a changing climate here in Montana specifically. I think fire managers across agencies have recognized that our seasons have been getting longer, that we have seen increased fire behavior, that we have a lot of people in this area and across the West moving into what we call the wildland urban interface, which is creating a more complex firefighting environment. So, this presentation, honestly, usually lasts about an hour. Um, we're gonna condense it and we're gonna cover things. We're gonna skim across the top of a lot of topics and I'm just gonna refer you to resources at the end, information and uh, some, some handouts that I have in the back. Typically, I would be doing this in, in February and so it would take a little bit of prompting. So the first few slides are simply, remember the smell of smoke in the air? Okay, it is working. So, is now the time to start preparing your home and property when you see this smoke column above your neighborhood? Yeah, we should, be, we should have done this a little earlier. Or now, is now the time to start thinking about things? Or maybe now, it's too late, right? So the, the idea is, and I'm sorry, I know that some people may have been intimately affected by fire this season. Um, but this is, this is what we're talking about. How about now? This is, this is evacuating too late. So it's two things. This is evacuating too late. This is, um, this is two o'clock in the afternoon on the Fort McMurray fire. So this is what happens when a large fire is creating conditions that look like midnight. And it shows you that blizzard of embers that swirls around homes and is often the source of a home ignition. So the reason I show these is just to, to kind of bring us back to, you know, a month ago, if that, or to what we've been seeing on the news in California, or what some of our local news has just been covering over the past 24 to 48 hours, as we had over a dozen fires start from escape debris burns and down power lines with the high winds of the last couple of days. So, like Steve was saying, our fire season has gotten longer. Our fire season here typically starts in March. Um, those dried grasses and fields of late August, September into October, snow falls, spring comes, snow melts, we get winds, we get some drying. Those are still really dry fuels in March, those are still dead grasses. So our spring season is a grass season. So we get spring season, we may get some moisture, we have our big fire season, and now, as we can see, we still have, we still have fire season in October. So March through October is what we're talking about. So the idea is fire can also move faster than you think. So I think when we, when we talk about fire and we think about fire, we think we're, we're, we're imagining walls of flame, 10,000, 30,000, 100,000 acres. That's what's gonna start a home on fire. And that's not necessarily the case either. Oftentimes we're talking, if you have a, a five acre, a 10 acre, a 30 acre fire, and it happens to be in your neighborhood, that's a big deal. 100 acre fire, so 
the point is that the preparation that we can take, we who have chosen, and I say we because I live east of town, up against public lands, three acres, trees that grow faster than I think they're going to, a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. I've got wood siding on my house. That's why I say we. So we have the responsibility of taking action around our home and our property to prepare for what is in, inevitable at some point, not necessarily at the point where you're living, but you know we're going to have a fire season in Western Montana. It may last a week sometimes. I think 2013, was it, 14? We had, a, we had fire week, we called it. That was it, that was our fire season. A pretty short, real fire season. Um, but then we have fire seasons like this season where we are in stage two restrictions and extreme fire danger, and every day there is the, the potential for large fire. So um, again, the, the point that we'll come back to is that the preparation is the same. So this, ah, it's, it might be spring, it might be fall. All I know is this, this is not fire season. So at this point, when the adrenaline is low, when you have time to prepare, when you have time to do the work around your home and your property, pull your papers together, make copies of important documents, this is a really good time to prepare for fire season. So we're talking fall and spring burn seasons. Who knows when our, I know you can't burn in the city of Whitefish, but if you live outside the city of Whitefish, who knows when our open burning seasons are? Who knows this? Dan, you don't count. <laughs> Neither one of you count up there. There are some familiar faces in the audience and you guys don't count. Open burn season, does anybody? You don't count either. Sorry, Travis. <laughs> October, you got it. We've got fall open burn season going right now, October 1st through November 30th, open burn season. That means you don't need a permit. You can go out there with your chainsaw. This is how you get started. You can get started with a handsaw. You go out there around your home and your property and you start pruning up branches and cutting down some of that, that regeneration, we call it. So, Larry, what size gla gloves do you wear? That was you. You answered, didn't you, Larry? No? Who answered October? Who is that? Oh, I'm sorry. What size? What? Tony. What size gloves do you wear, Tony? A medium. Okay. I just happen to have a pair of medium gloves. So... This means get out there around your home and your property, <laughs> do some work. <laughs> Tony. That's okay. <laughs> but the idea is now is a good time to get out there and do the, the work around your home and your property. Spring, March, April, right? March and April, yeah, fall, October, November, and then during our May, June, July, those are the only months you actually need a burn permit to do any burning. But those are great times to do it. When there's uh, no threat of fire. So we're talking about creating fire adapted communities. And that's a, that's a big concept. So we're, not, we're talking about individuals that live in the urban interface and that means that means you've got grass, you've got shrubs, you've got timber, you've got wildland fuels around you, which is most of us. So we're looking at a fire-adapted community. And so when you think community, what do you think of? Do you think of a collection of structures being fire-adapted? That might be part of it, but what I think are the people who are living in that collection of structures and the mindset that those people have living in forests that have adapted to wildfire. So that's a, that's a change in our, in our mindset, in how we think about fire, how we approach fire, how we prepare for fire. So fire adapted communities. So that means the neighborhood that you live in, the subdivision you live in, and as we collectively work with our neighbors, connect subdivisions, 
look outside of, of whitefish um, creating fire adapted communities. So we're looking at reducing fuels. We're looking at forest management. So if Mike West from the Forest Service would hear, was here, he would say that they've been doing a lot of forest management. They have, they have timber sales, they've got projects. You here in Whitefish are going to see smoke from prescribed fires. Maybe not this fall, but within the next year, there are prescribed fires planned for your area. There's a whole process involved with that. I'm not gonna talk about that, but Mike did want me to say there will be prescribed fire and that's part of forest management. So part of accepting that we live in those forests is accepting there, there's going to be a little bit of smoke in the air from that. Um, Ready, Set, Go. Ready, Set, Go is a program. Um, I have brochures in the back. That's all about preparing for your home and your fa family for an evacuation. So that's one part of becoming fire adapted. If you have a fire start in your area and it's time to evacuate, do you have a plan in place? Have you mentally thought through and prepared yourself for the eventuality of an evacuation? So when you go to put the keys in the ignition, maybe your heart isn't pounding quite so fast and maybe, do you know what I mean? That, that feeling of adrenaline when you're really nervous and jittery. And if you can go through even a mental exercise once, or you know that you're a little bit more prepared because you have boxed up those important things ahead of time. I can tell you there was a time this summer, it was 11.30 at night, it was windy, it was smoky, I knew there was a cold front coming, passing, and I couldn't sleep, and I thought, you know what? You live in the urban interface, you don't have a bag packed. Why don't you pack your bag right now? Because if you had a start in your neighborhood, you would need to evacuate right now. So 11.30 at night, what did I do? I packed two bags. I packed a bag of clothes for my son and I, that would be good, that would get us through about a week. And then I went through and I pulled photos, I pulled his baby book, I pulled the journal, I pulled the laptop, the camera, the important photos, anything that, and when you do a triage of your home and what you wanna take with you, ultimately it turns out to be not as much as you think. So that was an exercise for me, like if I need to evacuate, what am I gonna take? I carried those bags around with me in my car for two weeks just because I knew if I needed to evacuate, if I'm at work, if there's a fire start in my neighborhood, I, I at least had those most important things with me. So, ready, set, go. Um, codes and ordinances, I think Travis is gonna touch on that a little bit. Fuel buffers, I know that there's been a lot of fuel work around Whitefish, again, kind of a, a big shaded fuel break they've been working on for a long time. Uh, we're looking at prevention and education, so taking the opportunity that Steve and Karin to, did today to talk about some, some education and get the word out about fire. Um, our community wildfire protection plan. You guys have one here in Whitefish, community wildfire protection plan that I think is due for some updates. We have a Flathead County community wildfire protection plan that we're currently in the review process. So this is what we're talking about. This is a, a big umbrella. Um, becoming a fire-adapted community. Whoop. And all this means is if you are somebody involved in insurance, if you're a builder, if you're a landscaper, if you're a planner, if you work with emergency management, if you have outreach, education, marketing skills, we could use you in our Fire Safe Flathead group. We are looking for ways to communicate, ways to connect with folks in becoming um, fire adapted. So it is, a, it is a collaboration. It is all of us working together. It's cyclical, it's identifying projects and continuing to, to work together. Again, this is just review. This is what you can do, what you can do. Hardening your home, looking at your structure, if you're gonna replace your siding, let's replace it with hardy plank or something a little bit less combustible. Let's get those gutters cleaned out before fire season because when embers land there, that's where fires start. Let's put some vents up or some screening over, our, over any vent that has the potential to allow embers in. So this is hardening your home. This is looking at the home ignition zone. Is the home ignition zone a concept familiar to anybody? Besides Bambi or Mike, anybody, home ignition zone? 
okay, there's more information on that in the back. We're not going to go into it tonight, but there's more information. It's just the concept of 100 to 200 feet out from your home, recognizing like this is a place where you have the opportunity to reduce fuels, reduce the intensity of a, of a fire, allow or create space, defensible or what we like to call survivable space for firefighters to work and run equipment if they can actually respond to your location. So this, these are the places where you can uh, do a lot of work. So creating that defensible or survivable space, that big buffer around your home and your property, that big lean, clean, and green space. And you can imagine the difference when a firefighter is coming past and they have to really quickly decide which house they're willing to defend, willing to put some effort into. It's, it's going to be a pretty quick, quick decision here. They're going to drive past this one and they're going to say, you know what? This one, these folks have done some work around their place. We think we can be successful there. We think we can work safely there. So that's, that's what we're looking at. So evacuation and just making sure you have a plan. That may have seemed a little redundant, but I oftentimes repeat myself or get excited about topics. <laughs> so that's the whole, the, the end there is simply, uh, I think that's the end. Yes, so looking community-wide, creating fire-adapted communities, looking what, at what we can do as individuals living in the fire-adapted forests, creating fire-adapted communities, um, creating that defensible or survivable space, hardening your home, having an action plan for your family, including evacuation, having an emergency supply kit available, um, all these things together. So I think I got my, my time and Mike West's time in. And like I said, that's abbreviated. So I'm going to send you to the back table for a lot of information. And I just invite you to contact. There are cards in the back. This is, again, Fire Safe Flathead. Contact numbers, information, and our mission is we are individuals, neighborhoods, businesses, organizations, an agency wildfire professionals working together to promote fire adapted communities in the Flathead. We provide leadership, technical assistance, education, and resources. So if you're interested, we've got a lot of people involved and excited about this topic in creating fire adapted communities. So, yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he was saying that this morning there was a story on NPR that I, I actually missed, and they were, it was covering the fires in California. And the majority of the people, and I think there are over 40 people now that have, were killed in those California fires. And, the, and he's saying the majority of them were elderly. So over 60. So that would be a, a vulnerable population that we would give extra consideration to, and that's a great question. <laughs> It would take advanced planning, and that's communication within a neighborhood. Um, I, I, ugh, we haven't done much in regards to that specifically here. Uh, I know there are other programs where communities recognize those neighbors that need additional help in advance, both in helping them do work around their home and their property preparing that space, doing some fuels work. And there's a, there are organizations, not even organizations, there are neighborhoods out there that get together from 9 to noon on a Saturday, and they go do work on somebody's house together. And then they have a potluck afterwards. So it doesn't mean you have to always hire somebody to come and do some work for you. If you have neighbors, if you start talking about this, that's one step. The next step would be 
being in touch with those, those neighbors, having somebody identified to help, having a phone tree, having a way to communicate the situation, and then evacuating early. So not, and, and California is a different situation. They were up at 2.30 in the morning, 50 to 70 mile an hour winds. That's a, that's a really extreme situation. Travis, did you have anything? Overwhelming. So we could we can talk more about that. I'm um, gonna go ahead and pass the mic over. I think there'll be opportunity for more questions later. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we'll have uh, we'll bring all the panelists up at the end uh, for just general discussion because that question you ask Omar is actually applies also to the wildfire smoke issue because sometimes the most vulnerable populations are the ones that are tend to be isolated tend to be elderly or, or the very young in the case of smoke. Um, I want to introduce our, our next speaker um, who was made for the job he has. He's our new assistant fire chief uh, here in Whitefish. He comes by it honestly. He's got it in his genes. Uh, Travis Tweet. Um, he grew up here in Whitefish. He graduated from uh, Whitefish High School in 1985. Um, he went on to Flathead Valley Community College where he um, studied emergency and medicine emergency medicine and he went on to become an EMT intermediate and uh, through the years he's attended multiple classes at FEC in different state fire schools studying structural firefighting, hazardous materials response, wildland firefighting and incident command. His uh, um, time at the, he basically grew up at the fire station. Um, his dad, Ted, who a lot of people in this community know, um, served the department for 23 years as a volunteer firefighter, along with 36 years um, with the U.S. Forest Service on the Tally Lake Ranger District. Uh, so Travis was kicking around when he was a toddler probably there at the station and around fire camps and such. Um, he started himself as a volunteer firefighter here in Whitefish in 1988. And he was the first firefighter emergency medical technician hired for the city of Whitefish. So now we have a professional a fire department. And I guess you were the first, one of the first professionals then. Um, and he's worked his way through the ranks. And he was the training officer. And then he's promoted to shift captain. And then just a few months ago, he was promoted to become assistant chief and the fire marshal. And so he uh, spends a lot of his time focused on prevention. And so, Travis, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Thank you. Mine's going to be short and sweet because Ali did such a great job of covering everything that I, we typically talk about. But what I wanted to talk to you guys about, the chief kind of threw me under the bus on this one. He's supposed to be here tonight, but I am. I want to talk about the new urban interface code that are, the city of Whitefish has recently adopted. They... Uh, have only been adopted by two municipalities in the state of Montana. So we're under the infamacy of learning how we're going to enforce these. And I'm working along with the building department to figure out how we can enforce them. It's a tough battle telling somebody that they're going to start building with non-combustible constructive materials. And when it raises the cost of the construction, they're going to not go for it. So. We're trying to figure out how we can do it and how we can convince people that it's important. Um, for the most part, I don't have a whole lot more to cover. Uh, the few things that Allie did discuss were the ember showers. That's what we're concerned about. We know that it's not if, but when. And if it does happen, it's going to be catastrophic. And we're, everybody here is aware of that, and that's why you're here tonight. Um, some of the things I wanted to cover, you know, the, the WUI code talks about Cleaning your gutters, um, cleaning your eaves, screening off your attic vents. Don't s stack combustibles against your house, especially under vinyl windows. Properly display your street names and addresses so they're visible from the street. We need to keep fires on the ground, like Ali was saying. Limb your trees up. Um, keep defensible space. Get the trees spaced apart 10 feet, limbed up 6 feet. And the big thing for us, like I said, is addresses and visible street names and um, making sure that your driveways are 20 foot wide. They're 
they're uh, limbed up 14 feet so we can actually get engines down them. You have turnarounds at the end that are big enough for fire trucks to turn around. And make sure, you know, and what else helps is you have two ways out, more than one access. Um, and just clean up the ground litter, remove the dead trees. And like Ali said, when you're, when you're told to evacuate, evacuate, don't stay there, then we have to worry about getting in there to get you out. Um, other than that, I'm here for question and answer more than a lecture. I'm not a great public speaker, so I apologize. <laughs> you guys can laugh at me all you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we can take some, uh, some specific questions for Travis now, as well as for general comment, if you're willing to do that, Travis. Every chance I get to get a building sprinkled, I do. Um, it doesn't always happen. Uh, it depends on the occupancy and what's, you know, it depends on the occupancy of what's going into the building, the size of the building, square footage. You know, he's, he's very correct there. You know, we teach fire drills at the schools for a reason, and maybe this is something that should be taught in the elderly communities where there's nursing homes or assisted living facilities. They do fire drills, but they don't do a complete evacuation drill like this. What we tell people, and we have big events in town, is I want you guys to go to, let's say, the Food Depot parking lot or the Safeway parking lot, and we'll get an information person there and we will communicate with you there. There's water, there's food, and there's bathrooms. So that's what we do, what we want people to do. If we have people do, that have to evacuate, we'll send them there. We'll try to get buses arrangement for transportation. Um, situation well well in advance <laughs> sorry we're trying to use the mic just so it gets picked up by the okay thank you oh, we're gonna bring this back here in just a sec i'm gonna bring you the mic what if you're um tr what if there's like fire surrounding where your house and your and you have and you and it's coming closer every second Go to a safe area, a safety zone, what we would call it in the wildland side of things. Um, I don't have an answer for you. Hopefully your house has been cleaned up all the way around. You have defensible space. So the fire gets there, it's just going to burn itself out. It's not going to get to your house. Do you have another question? Go ahead.
Well, if we start enforcing this urban interface code, there is. We can get a hold of these people and have them actually get in touch with the owners and make them or require the city can re require them to do it in the city limits. It, it's in the, you know. You know, I'd have to go with the county on that and find out what the, try to talk to the county. And like I said, we're so early in enforcing the codes for the urban interface that we're not even sure exactly how we're going to go about that. It's going to be very difficult. Correct. So that's why I talk about having posted addresses, streets that are 20 feet wide, trees that are limbed up 14 feet, roads that have turnarounds at the end or they have more than one way out so we can get in and get out and we don't have to get in there and figure out how we're going to back out of this road for a mile and a half. Oh, definitely. Right, and what, how we handle that is we go in to these subdivisions or areas with multiple homes and we're going to triage those homes. We'll triage them and if, if, if the people living there have done anything at all to make it defensible and we think we have a chance of saving it, then we will do our best. But if we go in there and I've got limbs that are touching the building, trees right next to the house, rain gutters are full of pine needles, um, it's got cedar shake singles on it per se. We're going to write it off. We're going to red flag the road. We're not going in. We'll go to the next one that, that we think we can possibly save. No, it's... Yeah, you know, this is a... Trying to keep up with all the, the growth, the, the regrowth of this, it's just a constant battle. You have to do it every year. Everybody thinks they're going to get it done in one year, and when they should just be doing small bits at a time and get it done over a period of time, over every other year, like Allie was talking about, do it in the spring and fall, not during the fire season, waiting until the last minute to get it done. Yes, sir. That's more of a wildland question. Allie can speak for that. I My name is Dan Cassidy. I work for DNRC. I'm operations manager and uh, participate on the Type 1 team. Um, usually on the slurry bombers, they're allocated based on the preparedness level throughout the United States. Each region, there's nine regions, uh, forest service regions throughout the country, and each region has a preparedness level. And the uh, slurry bombers are national resources so they get moved around based on where the fire danger is the, the highest. So they could move slurry bombers in here as early as, you know, June if we have the fire conditions. 
And, you know, we have the advantage of having Neptune Aviation down out of Missoula, which is a, is a big contractor for slurry bombers. And then there's a lot of all smaller uh, single engine air tankers that are, are based in various locations around Montana, but it's, it's actually based on national preparedness levels. You mean if it's below freezing? Um, you know, I mean, a lot of times they're going to be here in the, the warmer temperatures, I guess, uh, if I'm following your question. Uh, Yeah, it would be, but the the way those fires um, are moving, they're mostly burning on the ground. They're putting up a lot of smoke, but um, they weren't ripping through the crowds of the trees right now. But yeah, I mean the the slurry would be effective, and they do use them most of the year. Yes, sir. Yeah, you look at the wind event we had. Like Ali stated earlier, we were very fortunate this year. We were on pins and needles the entire season going, man, we're lucky in whitefish right now. We haven't had hardly anything. The, the ones that we did get were, we, we were prepared. We jumped on them really quick. We had good mutual aid with DNRC. You know, it's just so you guys a little bit about whitefish fire. There's only four of us on duty, a minimum staffing of four people on duty every day. So we take what equipment we need, and we're hoping that we get the call early, we get there as quick as we can, and jump on it while it's still small. Try to keep them and hold them to a smaller fire. But every fire that we went to, which wasn't very many, we got lucky. We had great response with DNRC. We had three to five engines with, from DNRC as well to help us. Did that answer your question? Go ahead. Well, they very well could. There's possibility that insurance companies could start. I don't have an answer for you on that. Well, I do know that insurance companies won't insure buildings. When I do inspections in the commercial buildings, if they're not up to code or there's something that insurance companies call me all the time going, is this building meeting code? Is it safe for people to be in or occupy? And if it's not, I try to get it up for them, have them, you know, repairing stuff in the building to bring it up to code so that they, you know, insurance companies will, they will revoke their insurance if, if they don't. We'll have m more time for discussion um, at the end. Um, and in fact, I was at the last uh, Fire Safe Flathead meeting we were at last week. Um, someone from another part of the valley indicated that there's a couple um, homeowners that that did uh, lose their their insurance. They were dropped. Um, so increasingly, insurance companies are looking at this. Um, and by and large, not that many homes have burned in, in the wildland urban interface. And in large part, that's because Dan and, and these firefighting crews 
with a lot of money from the federal and state taxpayers are protecting those homes. And so the, the, the true cost of, of um, the risk is not really, has not really been born yet. But now that we're seeing a lot more homes burning, insurance companies are taking a real hard look at it. Um, one of the, you know, one of the issues that we're dealing, we're, we're grappling with at the Climate Action Plan Committee in terms of the recommendations we give to the City Council, and this is something that, you know, maybe we can discuss later if anybody has any input onto it, the, the fire department, the City of Whitefish Fire Department provides structural protection, um, you know, throughout this broader region, well outside of the donut, um, and that's under a contract um, through the county and, 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 and through this this, uh, the fire area um, district, fire service area. Um, this wildland urban interface code that Montana has adopted and now the city has adopted, that is, that's legally in place for the entire state. It's not just, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that applies to everybody, but there's, if there's no enforcement of that, you know, it's, it's only worth the paper it's written on, but insurance companies may increasingly look at that. And one of the things we're thinking, you know, we're asking is, okay, is there some way through those contractual arrangements where the city provides fire protection outside of city limits that we can, you know, either through education or what have you, that give Travis a little more teeth to encourage your neighbors that are not taking care of their fuel problems and that are endangering your place so that if it is a violation of the statewide WUI code, that we can do something about it. And, and we don't know the answer. We're just starting to look into that question. Um, we're going to move on here to the, the next topic here, which is obviously closely related because where there is fire, there is usually smoke. And uh, smoke is becoming a big issue. Um, and it's not just local fire that produces smoke. Um, we get smoke from all over um, the western United States and western Canada, and it likes to hang in these intermountain valleys. And um, what can we do about that is the question. Well, it turns out that there are things we can do. And Amy Sillenberg is the director of Climate Smart Missoula, which is sort of our sister organization for Climate Smart Glacier Country. Um, they're a, an affiliate of the uh, Missoula Community Foundation in, in Missoula, and they have um, taken on a big program to address uh, wildfire smoke and the vulnerability. So we've asked Amy to come up and discuss what they've been doing there for the last year or two, um, just starting to get a program up. Um, I've known Amy for quite a few years. She's worked on climate and energy policy for at least the last decade, um, encouraging solutions at the local, state, and federal levels. She did much of this work um, through Montana Audubon and by volunteering locally. Um, she was involved in M Missoula's climate action plan before they created Climate Smart Missoula. Um, she's thrilled to be putting her passions to work, leading Climate Smart Missoula, strengthening connections throughout the community, initiating new programs, and ensuring this remains a resilient community. Thank you for coming up from Missoula, Amy. Thank you, Steve and Karen, for having me. And thanks, everybody, for um, listening to somebody from Missoula, because we, um, <laughs> we're happy to share um, what we know, and we're happy to learn from other communities. So a little side note, um, I was sitting in a coffee shop with Steve a few years ago, and we were racking our brains as to what to call our effort, which um, was inspired by work with Steve and other folks around the state. And we're coming up with all these wacky, creative names, and he looks at me and goes, why don't you just call it Climate Smart Missoula? And we're like, okay. <laughs> That's a good idea. So we got it first, and then now there's Climate Smart um, Glacier County or Country, which we're um, thrilled to work together. Um, so I was just going to spend two, three minutes of, of describing our organization just so you know how we got into being the group that ended up providing air filters to elderly seniors in Sealy Lake. 
Like, it's kind of a stretch and kind of an interesting path. Um, I'll just share it with you really quickly how we got there. Um, with the idea that I, I want to share what we are learning, continue to learn, about how to be healthy as a community um, when we're stressed with wildfires, in particular, um, the smoke piece of it. Um, and I'll, I think the next speaker will hear more about some of the health impacts and some of the health, what we think about from health. I'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, so just I'll first say, if you're interested in any of the work that we do and more, I have a lot of resources. I have some in the back, but um, they are available at climatesmartmissoula.org. We have a Facebook page too. So um, kind of easy to find us and easy to find these resources. Um, we are a community-driven effort. We got a lot of people and leaders, uh, local government, community leaders together over the course of a number of years and developed a climate action, climate smart action plan, we call it, about two years ago. And it really... Um, Climate Smart uh, evolved out of a bunch of these community meetings, very similar to the work that you folks are doing here. Um, and we've taken that action plan and we realized, you know, we needed an, a group, a nonprofit to steer it, to help implement it, and to move it forward. Um, so again, you can uh, read the whole 138 pages on our website. Um, I'm sure it will be, it's, it's really riveting, but not, it won't be quite as good as the one you guys are working on. Um, but our main job is to foster partnerships and um, actions to address climate change. It's a very collaborative effort, as was already discussed here. Um, we, none of us can do any of this work without a lot of um, deep uh, friends and partners. Um, the way our kind of climate action plan is, is worked out is we have a bunch of focal areas and we call them buckets. Um, everything from transportation to renewable energy, zero waste, a whole bunch of things you think about in terms of sustainability, um, your carbon footprint. Um, at the core of what we do is really education and outreach and also um, the inventory, trying to figure out what our greenhouse gas emissions are and those things. Um, but there is a whole bucket of community health, a healthy community. And that's where um, this work kind of has its roots. Um, this particular focus area, our goal is to enhance our climate-related disaster and threats preparedness, educate Missoulians and others <laughs> about the climate health link and build a more resilient individuals and community. Um, so clearly as climate change um, is impacting us, we need to be thinking about how we can um, how we can do more and prepare, and really, um, it's all about considering the most vulnerable among us. Or it's not all about that, but that is an important factor that can be overlooked. And this will get to speaking about um, the elderly in wildfire situations for sure. Um, they're a, a big part of that. Um, and that's just a picture of Sealy Lake, I think, on a good day um, this summer. Like, at least maybe by the afternoon as things were lifting. Um, they, had it, they had it tough, as folks know. Um, Um, so we came up with a program um, in the last two years that we've, um, we're climate smart, so we um, call our program Summer Smart. You know, how do, we, how do we weather the new weather? How do we actually prepare for the changes that we're seeing now and expect to see more of? And I kind of like how it uh, dovetails nicely with FireWise, Summer Smart. Um, and in particular, what we're looking at is, you know, these days where there's a lot of smoke in our region and where we're seeing some really hot temperatures. And actually, the combination of those two things together um, can be really um, difficult and trying and challenging for especially our vulnerable folks, um, young, you know, pregnant moms, young babies, but especially the elderly. Um, so again, this is a whole... Uh, there's a whole bunch of resources that over the last two years we've developed, and we, as we've learned about how best to deal with wildfires, you can't see this too well, hotter days, um, there's a whole bunch of, of resources and, and work that we've put into helping to explain the risks and what to do, and this is what our website looks like, and there's lots of information there. Um, so climatesmartmissoula.org, summer smart. Um, because sure enough, you know, it's going to be next summer when we're starting to think, now what did we talk, what did we think about in terms of what masks I might use if the smoke is bad or some of those things? Um, you don't have to commit it all to memory. We're trying to build resources that we can share across the country. I've talked to people from Washington, Oregon, and most recently California about some of the resources that you know we're getting out there. We just want them to be used. Um, but in particular, the wildfire smoke is where we've put a lot of our efforts. Um, it, you, it, Missoula is similar in some ways, maybe to, white, to whitefish, in that we're in a valley bottom and we get a lot of wildfire smoke that will just linger because of that geography of being down in a valley. Um, and it's been a concern 
if, uh, you know, for many, for years, obviously, we have summers where it's really bad. And, you know, our strategy's sort of been, well, let's just pray for rain or leave town. And um, kind of feeling like that's, insu that, that's not insufficient, especially because the folks that can leave town are maybe the folks like myself, and I'll grab my family and we'll go, you know, camping a different part of the state when it gets really bad. But not everybody can leave town. And as we saw this summer, the season that lasted so long that that really wasn't feasible. So again, we've developed um, information on health risks, how to protect your health, air, links to air quality information, um, not just for Missoula, but again, a wider region but it does focus a little bit on what we're doing. We also, I won't show them tonight, but we have a couple short videos, like little animated videos um, that work really well to help people understand the risks and then what they can do about it. Um, and those are, again, this, like, this is parts of what our, our, our uh, website looks like. Um, we have infographics. We have all kinds of just ways that we can get the information out. Some people really like to read long reports and some people like, um, videos and some people like to read infographics. So we're just trying to get as much there as we can. Um, hit it that way. Oh, skipped one. So, you know, we have a basic things that we think about when wildfire smoke hits. And again, I'm going to get into talking, I think, and the title of this was getting into thinking about indoor air quality and what you can do. Um, but the basic things that we have suggested for people to really think about is monitoring air quality levels. They vary, as people know, day to day, region to region. We had parts of Missoula that would be pretty good air and other parts that would be really poor air. So understanding how you can know what the air quality is at any one time in your community is um, super important. Um, it's really hard for people, especially as smoke is there for a long time, to limit their activity outside. But again, there's recommendations about how active to be and uh, based on what those air quality levels are. And is everybody pretty familiar after this summer with what I'm speaking about here and the air quality? You know, is it hazardous for um, sensitive populations or very unhealthy or all those, the different categories they had, has different implications about how active to be. Um, but that can be very difficult for people. This summer, um, as it was getting really bad in Missoula, we ended up um, my daughter runs cross country, and the cross country coach has oftentimes in the past just said, well, it's too smoky to run, so we can't have practice. And then under his breath, we'd say, go run anyway. And we're like, that is not okay. Um, and we're seeing the health folks go, yeah, that is not okay. But he actually really didn't understand the implications of breathing that wildfire smoke in, the PM 2.5 that you can't see, that very hazardous material, it gets into your lungs, it's, it's, you cannot cough it out, it never leaves your body, it flows into your bloodstream, it is very unhealthy. Um, the air quality specialist in Missoula actually looked at, they've looked at health records, and when Missoula had very bad air quality in the winter a few decades ago, they saw a decrease in the athletic ability of youth growing up in Missoula. And it's a correlative study, but it was, it was real. And, um, there, and that's because they were breathing in a lot of really unhealthy air over time. So it's not something to just, you know, laugh about, um, we ended up working with a bunch of fitness centers in Missoula to allow the kids could, to run on treadmills. And they ran on treadmills day after day. Um, it was very difficult, but that was the best response because those treadmills were indoors and there was air conditioning and they were filtered. They probably weren't completely clean air inside, but it was better. So anyway, the, the whole activity is something that we need to think about, and we need to work with those folks that are making those decisions. Coaches have a very difficult time telling their kids, their athletes, not to participate in sports. It's very difficult to cancel a Little League fo uh, bas you know, baseball game, even though you probably might need to. Um, so, you know, basic recommendations when it's very smoky out, again, when we're getting to the unhealthy levels, hazardous levels, is to keep all the doors and windows shut and stay inside. And then I'll talk more about what you're going to do inside. Um, avoid spending long periods of time outside. And then the final, you know, again, these are, are sort of some of the key recommendations. There are more than this. Using an air purifier, an air conditioner with a filter on it can really clean the indoor air. 
Um, the other thing that we did, and I'm going to come back to those air filters in the indoor air in a second. We, we also created and looked at a map of, of places, both places where people could go if they needed to cool down, because heat is another piece of this whole climate changing um, world we're living in, um, but also places where there were clean air, um, places where people could go where there was air conditioning and um, and we created a whole map, sort of an interactive map. And the other thing that we continued to do both last summer when we didn't see much smoke or, I mean, sorry, 2016, we did not see much heat or smoke. And then this past year is we actually have some air monitors indoors that we're trying to understand how healthy the air is inside at some of our public spaces. So um, it's an ongoing exercise of building awareness and actually understanding among health professionals. We're working with some folks at the University of Montana to do continued research on that. Um, but mostly I wanted to um, um, get in and talk a little bit about HEPA air filters. These are portable air filters that you can plug in to you know, your wall socket and they'll clean your air. How many people have one or got one this summer? A couple folks here. Um, they are amazingly effective, and I want to just share the story of how we ended up outfitting folks in Missoula area and in Sealy Lake and actually all the way up into the Swan Valley and down um, River Valley um, also with these. Um, we have, a, this is again information from our website, don't worry about it if you can't read it, but we pulled together a lot of information about these air filters. And this came from, I'm not an air quality specialist, nor do I have an advanced degree and not a health professional, but we started working with our health department and a couple years ago saying, you know, when the smoke is really bad, you know, what can we do other than tell people to leave town, um, which does not feel, you know, uh, completely sufficient. And Sarah Cofield, who's our air quality specialist in Missoula, said, you know, I just love to buy these filters and give them to people. And so we thought about how that would be a kind of neat thing to do, to give them to the people um, who are the most vulnerable. Um, we knew that we could potentially find some funding to give these to folks that couldn't buy their own or couldn't go out and get one. But what we did first was just kind of understand criteria, what you might look for, how to get them. And then most people who could afford to go buy one, we said, go buy one. Um, and that we started to do this summer, and we are still giving people advice about these air filters. We've kind of... Um, it seems like we know lots about them now because we really had to learn fast. Um, so sure enough, you know, we had, we had situations like this in Missoula and everybody, you know, across obviously Montana where um, the fire started to blow up. Um, let's see. Um, and then, of course, from that you get, you know, times where the smoke is really bad and you can't. You can't see. So we, we anticipated this in part of the planning work that Climate Smart's been doing over the years. And we ended up um, getting a grant this past uh, spring from one of the local hospitals in Missoula to start a program to purchase these air filters and give them to some of our most vulnerable, which, as already been mentioned, are some of our seniors, our older adults that live in Missoula and are homebound. Um, so we worked with our aging services group, and they have a Meals on Wheels program. Meals on Wheels Pro folks are homebound, but we, um, they referred us to a number of clients who are income qualified. They don't have the means to go out and buy this, um, buy these filters, but they're, you know, they're living in their homes and they, they don't, they can't leave. That's why they're getting Meals on Wheels, right? And they um, gave us a, a list, ended up being about 25 folks, and we delivered filters to them. And they're like, Wow, and we actually asked them, we did a whole series of, of questions, a doctor called them and, you know, how did you, how did you do back in 2015 where we had very bare, bad air in Missoula for about a week, extremely hazardous air for about a week, and a lot of them remembered that they did very poorly. They went to the hospital. They had to up their medication. So we um, targeted folks with respiratory issues. Most elderly are susceptible, whether they have you know, COPD or some actual respiratory disease, it's just harder for your body as you get older to process wildfire smoke. It's not just your lungs, it's also, um, it's also your whole cardiovascular system, um, you know, heart attacks, strokes, and those things can be affected by smoke. So we actually gave these away and we started giving them to these folks and it was just about then that it was heating up and we were starting to get some fires. And, um, and we, 
we were pretty happy that we were able to get some of these, these filters out. And we had worked with a company that, there's a lot of companies that makes these filters. We'd found one company that was producing, making a filter that we really liked, this Winix company. Um, they're Energy Star, they're washable filters, they have really good recommendations. And we just started working with this company who gave us a discount. And then this, you know, basically this situation happened and, um, you know, these are some of those air quality pieces that you um, that you may have seen. I guess it's pretty hard, but you know, as the air quality gets bad, um, this I don't know if you can see it, but this is what Sealy Lake would look like almost every single morning, where that blue line, which again I think it's hard to see, it would top out into the hazardous. It was basically three times the top of the monitoring limit for what is hazardous almost every single morning in Sealy Lake. And then it would drop down to just unhealthy for a few hours, and then it would climb back up. The health department did suggest to people that, again, you should leave, but people couldn't, or they often didn't. And so we were, they were having a lot of, of people coming into the clinics not doing very well. And so we just started buying filters and running up our credit card and giving them to um, the health department to bring up to Sealy Lake. Because again, we had the program up and running, we knew how to get them, we had a, a contact at this company, and we just started getting them there. And um, they, we've been following up with some of those folks. Um, I just talked to an elderly gentleman who is on oxygen, he has asbestos disease and COPD. He's been sleeping in a recliner for two months now next to his air filter, as has his wife. And he said, I'd be dead without that. And so these air filters, you size them appropriately. We've given one, and we tell people, you know, you put it in your room. You have to keep the windows and doors closed. They're not perfect. They move the air through a filter, and it's remarkable how it can help. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not taking really dirty hazardous air and purifying it, but it's cleaning it to a point that people can breathe. And so every single person we've talked to um, actually really experienced a, a health benefit from these. And you know, this, we're just asking folks, it's somewhat anecdotal, we're working with the university to see if we can turn this into better research. Um, but we have learned a lot, and, and this comes from recommendations from other folks around the country that these are effective. Um, but we have learned a lot about that, and so I, you know, I'm bringing this whole thing up now because we're continuing to tell people that think about what an air filter can do for your home. I don't even get any money from this company that we're <laughs> recommending. Um, I wish I did, but because um, we, they ended up, you know, various companies that. Uh, make these things they ended up, you know, selling hundreds and hundreds in Missoula. So we worked again to get them to the most vulnerable folks in Sealy Lake, which were elderly, but also some folks with, you know, young young children with asthma and babies that just came home from the hospital and things. And then as our, you know, again, our season is getting longer, and all of a sudden, Sarah who I work for with the health department, is like, the kids are going back to school. We are telling children they have to be in school, and yet their school is a toxic place to be. It's a pretty interesting dilemma. If this was water, FEMA would come in and give us clean water. But air is not looked upon in that same way. The health department actually couldn't buy filters and give them away because they're not allowed to give equipment away. Eventually, you could figure out the asthma program has a way to get people you know, free filters, but it's a long, arduous process. And this was something we needed to do immediately, if not two weeks ago. Every time we ordered filters, we wish we'd had them the week earlier. Um, it's again, it's, it's, the, you, it's the similar preparation you're doing to firewise your home and your area. We are thinking about for indoor air health and, and the quality of, of the indoor air, especially in some of our public spaces. So the health department and with the schools and Climate Smart, we all started buying more filters for the schools, both in Sealy Lake. Then we moved down to Lolo, which was really bad. We bounced up to the Swan Valley and bought them filters so that the children who had to be back at school could come back to school. Now, some suggested you could just cancel school, but where were those kids going to be? They were going to be playing outside or in their homes where there was very poor air at that time. So the whole idea that we're thinking about, again, with a bunch of partners in Missoula, especially our, our city county health department, is how can we make our schools and our public places the healthiest place and really a, a place you could go in an emergency situation. Um, and we actually found that just these portable air filters work. There are other parts, um, you know, schools that have central air. They may have HEPA air filters. Um, which is the kind that is needed, a HEPA filter is the kind that's needed to filter out the really small stuff. Um, some air conditioners or some central air systems have those. So not everybody needs 
um, these particular filters. I think I have a couple pictures um, of what these filters look like, and this is myself and, and Sarah getting boxes of them and handing them out. Um, not every situation needs this kind of a filter, but it needs, uh, you know, we need to be thinking about something. So right now we're having some meetings with our school systems to think about over time, could every school have clean air? Which, you know, again, is that really that crazy of a thing to ask for? It seems pretty obvious. Um, you know, the, we, there's times where you might use these air filters when we're talking about more prescribed fire. People sometimes get upset with pres prescribed fire because it makes the air both outside and inside their homes unhealthy. But if we think about ways that we can clean it, um, it may allow us to be a little more comfortable with prescribed fire. It can also help during an inversions and those things. So um, kind of what we're learning, I guess, in a nutshell at, at Climate Smart Missoula is that by partnering with folks that do health preventative, um, efforts that work in disaster services, we can come up with some new and innovative ways to, um, you know, to get people some of the things that they need. And in this particular situation, um, I know we kept some people either out of the hospital and, and maybe even, you know, alive in that in that situation. So um, it's something. It's the the filter thing is something to think about. And then just understanding what you can do. Um, you know, do masks work? There's certain kind of masks that do. Our health department. Um, actually doesn't really recommend them because they're hard to fit and then people end up breathing harder to try to get the air in and if you already have a respiratory issue you're going to be straining your body so they recommend them with sort of caveats that it may they may make it may make it challenging to breathe. So there's issues with masks. There's benefits with masks. There's issues with um, trying to make, you know, get clean air indoors. It can cost money. How do you fund it? All those kinds of things. Um, but if we start thinking now, we're working with hospitals, working potentially with insurance companies, maybe we can have the money that we could have to, to keep people healthy in their homes. So it's kind of a big collaborative um, looking at this new future that is here, <laughs> I guess I'll say. Um, so I think that's really what just wanted to touch on that there are there are some options of things that we can do. Um, you know, the other thing we tried to do in Missoula, um, again, with, with some of our partners, is just really talk honestly and openly about the, the challenge that we're living in. Because in Missoula, it wasn't so much scary in terms of fires beating down our walls, but it got really difficult emotionally and mentally to be in that smoke. It's really draining, it's ominous, you feel like you know it can, it can affect people very differently. People are used to exercising and being out in the mountains and all of a sudden they're shut indoors. So trying to in, in bring up some conversations, talk about that, talk about the need to care for our own mental health. And then a big part of all of our work um, if you watch our little videos, you know, is to check in on your neighbors, as was already discussed a little bit, and your friends, and make sure maybe that if there's an elderly couple that lives a couple doors down, that you're um, that you're helping them. We had folks that went out and bought air filters for their neighbors, and and just kind of, you know, it's the partnerships and the collaboration and the neighborliness that really is going to help us when we're in these um, challenging conditions. And you know. They, they do end, it's been beautiful and blue sky and clear air down in Missoula now. And we also, a lot of, you know, folks survived, but we know it's gonna come up again. Um, so happy to answer questions now or be part of a panel later if you wanna talk. Yeah, why don't we um, go to, Hil I've got some questions for you, but I'm, gonna, I'm holding them because I'd like um, Hillary to go from our, our, the local Flathead County perspective and then, uh, and then air quality questions, we can have both of them up here. Um, Hillary Hansen is the health officer um, for Flathead City County Health Department. She received her master's degree in applied statistics from Purdue University um, and an MPH, Master of Public Health. Yeah. I got that, all right. Yeah. As in public health leadership from the University of North Carolina. In her role as the health officer um, for Flathead County, Ms. Hansen oversees the environmental health air quality program for, the, for Flathead County. She also wears statewide hat. She serves on the Montana Board of Environmental Review. Thank you for coming to Whitefish tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, this is obviously a topic near and dear to everyone's heart this time of year, and I actually live by Foy's Lake, so you can imagine this is really near and dear to my heart currently. I just wanted to go over some of some basic information really touching on what Amy's already touched on, but specific to Flathead County, so you guys have some of this information. 
So we do have three air quality monitoring stations in Flathead County. There's one located in Columbia Falls, one in Whitefish, and one in Kalispell. When you're looking at monitoring the air quality for our county, what you're going to find is if you go to that website that Amy talked about, which is a DEQ website called Today's Air, what you're going to see is the air quality monitoring from our um, monitoring station in Columbia Falls because that's the monitoring station that does that PM 2.5, which are those smaller particles that we're worried about people inhaling and can really cause the health issues. And so the reason I bring that up is that for the most part when you're looking at that website and considering air quality, it's probably true of no matter where you are in Flathead County as a whole. And so you can really use that as a guide for the activities you wanna do. However, we have had times a year where some of the air quality has differed where you are. This was one of those years where we would get reports that you can't see five feet in front of you somewhere and somewhere else the air quality seemed a lot better. And so one of the things we really look at, and Amy referred to this, but we do have a nice sheet and we have handouts of this in the back, but this really goes through that um, healthy and good all the way to hazardous. And what we have on this is also a visibility chart. And so we encourage people to really utilize the visibility chart sometimes when you're concerned about wherever you are and does it match up with the air quality in Columbia Falls that's showing up on, your webs on the website. So the idea behind that is really picking a location that you know the distance of, can you see it, how far can you see, and then judging the air quality based on that. So a few things we did in Flathead County this year, one of them is to make sure that this handy sheet was as many places as it could possibly be in the community so that people were making decisions truly based on what the recommendations are for their health. So we wanna make sure that when it says you should only be doing light activity, you're only doing light activity. We also want to be sure when we're in that unhealthy for sensitive groups that people are recognizing the sensitive groups around us. It can be elderly, it can be people with health issues, but we also need to consider kids and other people's, or all, all the kids that have those young lungs, those infants, those others, and really consider them to be a vulnerable population too. Um, one of the other components we did, and I don't have this as a handout, but it's on our website if anyone's interested in it, there are also recommendations of what schools should do. And so we ask all the schools in Flathead County to be following these recommendations, ensuring parents had these recommendations so that we were all making decisions the same across Flathead County. So this guide actually goes through, you know, if it's unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy, whatever category, what you would do for resources, PE classes, athletic practices, all the way to scheduled sporting events. And so I know at least in Kalispell and I believe Big Fork and maybe Whitefish, I don't know that for a fact, this was actually even sent out to parents so that they could understand how schools were making their decisions about when to cancel events or when to keep them ongoing. And that's what we're really trying to ensure is there's that consistency across this. We do meetings with both um, superintendents, teachers, coaches, um, athletic directors, trying to make sure that all this information is out and in the community. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on when we talk about air quality, it was mentioned earlier, open burning. And one of the components that we do with open burning at the health department is we actually open and close it based on air quality. So while we talked about that right now we're in open burning, the rules are actually that we're in open burning if you call our air quality hotline and it also states that we're open because of air quality. So um, that phone number, if anyone wants to write down, but it's also on our website, all the info, but it's 751-8144 and that's updated on a daily basis to really look at the weather, look at the air quality and determine if open burning should be done. So we wanna make sure that even in the times we're not necessarily talking big fires that we're also considering air quality throughout the year just from those components too. Any 
anything else? Kate, did I miss any? I have our environmental health coordinator here too, Kate Cassidy, in case you guys ask me hard questions. Yeah. In terms of what they're burning specifically? Yeah, and Missoula deals with <laughs> house smoke more than others, but that is a piece that we try to do education on too. I don't know if you want to touch on that anymore. You're correct on that too, um, because the carbon monoxide too that we, you know, wood fire creates. We don't don't have an ordinance here in Flathead County like Missoula does, and that was passed years ago. So that's really an education piece we can do, but not an enforcement piece. The enforcement piece we can do um, in terms of open burning is really looking at what people are burning and making sure they're burning materials that should be burned and not those that shouldn't um, from a health standpoint. And so if you have questions, concerns, you can call the health department. We have all the information on our website about what's allowable to burn, what's not allowable to burn during those open burning times. But in addition to that, if there's concerns about what a neighbor's doing or others are doing, we are here to look at those pieces too. Yeah. You know, so the my understanding of wildfire smoke is it's got it's got a whole bunch of different things in it, not just um, particulate matter size, but also volatile chemicals. And so every fire is going to have different components to it. Um, the big stuff that you can see, the embers and the stuff that you can see that pops out of a campfire or comes from a wildfire, that stuff is actually. Um, it's easier for our body to deal with because we can cough it up and we it doesn't go, it gets into our lungs in a way that we can then respond to it. The PM 2.5 and the reason they have that on the DEQ or Department of Environmental Quality, that that's why they're monitoring that is because that's the thing that our body doesn't have any response mechanisms for. Um, it gets in and it's in. And so, you know, again, it's a, it's a myriad of things. Um, and it's also, there's a dose response and there's a time response. So, you know, breathing in a little bit of that, for most people, you're going to be okay. Um, I mean, I went out and rode my bike a little in the really crappy weather because I had to get somewhere and I'm, I'm okay. Um, people are, have very varied sensitivities to that. My next door neighbor, who's my age and also active, had to leave town, she's so sensitive. For whatever reason, her physiology is different. So I guess that the main thing is it's, it's sort of more complicated, but you can, um, one, listen to your own body and understand your own health and how you respond to it, and that of your family, neighbors, and things, and then kind of take measures based on that. But the reason that people are so concerned about um, some of the areas, Lolo and Sealy Lake, that were downwind of those fires that went on and on forever is because the longer you're in it without a break and reprieve, the harder it is for your body. Um, and again, it's some things that your body can just cough out. Um, our hospital is still seeing um, higher levels of, or they're still seeing individuals that are, um, has bodies are stressed, asthmatic kids in particular, um, that came, that they are associating with the smoke that we had. Um, so, I don't think that exactly answered your question, but it's vi there's a lot of different pieces to wildfire smoke or any other kind of smoke. Wood smoke in your house, too, if you have a, a wood stove. Same thing, lots of difference. Did you have? I actually have a question. Oh, a question? Yeah, I have a question, not a comment. I'm, I'm just, I'm an interested yeah. member of the audience now. Um, but I thought that this gentleman had a really good question because when we're talking about wildfire and we're talking about wildfire smoke, we're talking about fire across the landscape that's burning grasses, shrubs, needles, leaves, um, entire components across a landscape. And when we're talking about what we burn in our wood stoves, we're isolating, we're just, you know, using really cured dry wood. So I have, the, I have a similar question, like, is that smoke actually different or is it the same? It is different smoke. In a wildfire? 
versus what we, we, we are pretty particular about what we put in our, okay. So like you said, we don't have ordinances and on those days where we don't have good ventilation and maybe we've shut down debris burning, but we're still burning wood in our stove so that decreases our air quality in the valley, it's different, maybe? Either way, okay. It's probably it's sometimes it's backwards. Okay. But you know that's where um, there are communities that are making headway. We do have an ordinance, uh, ordinance to do it, and it's just impossible to make way for wood stoves um, right now, and you can't use them right now. There are wood stoves. There are wood stoves being sold that are not necessarily prohibitively expensive, depending on who you are. That have better that that basically produce very little to no air pollution in the house, um, and pellet, even better than pellet stoves. So there are things that people can do. Um, the Missoula Health Department did a program in Sealy Lake to actually go in and replace old wood stoves in people's homes um, to keep the indoor air in their homes that much healthier. So um, that's you can think about it from the indoor and and the outdoor perspective too, that community efforts to educate people on, you know that old wood stove you've had for 40 years, you might wanna think about upgrading it and having people um, with the information they may need that they would help them make those kind of smart decisions um, along the way. And you know, that's a big project, not everybody's gonna do it, but it can cumulatively help a community's air shed if you have better wood stoves um, to, yeah. They're measuring all year long. <laughs> so we actually did a study a couple years ago, um, and there was a monitor set up at the Whitefish High School, and we did some monitoring of carbon monoxide and some of the uh, more for what was the train um, <laughs> idling of the diesel trains sitting there, and it was found um, on that study that it's most of the uh, particulates that we're finding here in whitefish was from wood burning stoves, not from diesel running trains, which it w a lot of people were concerned. Yes. It could have been, yeah. So we looked at locations on where to put this mo these monitors, and it, uh, Whitefish High School was on top of the roof up there, and. We'd get some of that information, but the purpose of monitoring Yes, twenty twenty four hours. It's so it posts every it, hour. You you could go up there right now and look on it. The hour. So you can see hour by hour. hour yeah, you can see that. It's, it's up all the time. You know, in the, when it was so bad in Sealy Lake, they didn't have an air monitoring. <coughs> They and brought they one in. One, and then we got another one up in the Swan Valley, not Sioux, but the yeah, Clearwater Junction. Clearwater Junction. And, you know, maybe that is something that we as a, a larger community of the state of Montana need to update. More, more monitors. Because there was a lot of air pollution in the Sioux Valley. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, thank you, and that's a good comment, and I can't really speak to the history of where we were at in Flathead County if we looked at that in the past, did we, Kate? But one of, that's one of the reasons why we don't allow uh, open burning during the winter seasons, because of inversions in that. You've got your warmer, it acts as a blanket, you've got the warmer air on top and the colder air down below, and it just doesn't mix out. So that's one of the reasons why we don't uh, let open burning, so Allie could. But I think it's a good point, Matt. Yeah. Right. Enforcement where would the policy be? The only probably place that these kind of things would be reviewed is from our Board of Health. So we are governed, our health department is actually governed by a Board of Health, not by the county commissioners. So they do review and look at policy items associated with health issues. Well, they're illegal in Missoula. Yeah, they're totally illegal. Yeah, and if you change, if a property changes ownership, you have to make sure that it doesn't have um, even a fireplace, I think. It has to be, you can do have a fake wood stove. Not that people don't have them and that people don't go around that rule, but so we don't have any ordinance there. The, the program that our health department did up in Sealy Lake, which is part of Missoula County. Our health department is city county combined. Um, they actually went in and just replaced them. They had money from uh, the 2008 stimulus package, federal money. Um, you know, people look around for some of those monies, and if you can make a case for health, you know, sometimes there are health foundations in particular out there. Um, some of the funding that came from our, you know, opportunity to just buy these air filters um, came from both of our, ended up coming from both of our hospitals. Um, so there may be opportunities to find some creative ways um, to provide some of those incentives. No, that's not what we were saying. Um, no, so the que I think what, what Kate had brought up was a study that was done in Whitefish a couple years ago, and the intention, because we get a lot of calls from the Whitefish area about the diesel, and so what we actually did was to try to set up to monitor specifically to see if we saw additional impact from diesel that was causing big issues in whitefish. And what the study found, and this was from the University of Montana, um, they're the ones that ran the study, was that wood smoke was causing more of an air quality issue in whitefish than the trains. Not to say they're not still an issue, they still can cause air quality issues. We were trying to figure out how much specifically are they contributing to the air quality issues in whitefish. Do you remember from that study? We don't have it off the top of our heads, but I would be happy to get the study to Karin and maybe she can post it or send it out to people who are here and you are welcome to read it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
So yeah, the short answer to that on the broader level is no. We're still, on a regular basis, what we're measuring is the particulate matter. That being said, I know that DNRC and DEQ have been engaged before on if there's specific concerns relating to fires, um, looking at whether additional monitoring needed to occur for specific chemicals or other issues to that. I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that. But like an example I can give that never ended up happening, but we were worried in 2015, was that? Whatever year, there was a other bad fire year, um, about a snow shed in Essex. So it's a mile long snow shed that the train goes through and it's actually creosote soaked timber. And so we were actually looking with DEQ of ways that if that lighted that we would put, or if that caught on fire that we could actually look at other concerns that might be part of that burning, but we don't do it on a regular basis. It really becomes down to specific concerns. I just wanted to once again let folks know that there are resources available um, and information in the back. My name is Allie. I'm on a card in the back. Um, so if you are interested in a home assessment, we do home assessments. We come out and we will take a walk around your home and your property. They're just, they're free. I work with a forester. Uh, depends on, I mean, what, how many acres you have. We talk about forest health, insects and disease. We do that kind of a thing. If you are a member of a homeowner association, if you're excited about this kind of thing, if you want to get some neighbors involved, we go and we do presentations. We set up in somebody's garage, in somebody's living room, in somebody's community space. We can come and, and do community assessments. There are, there are a number of opportunities. If you want more education or you want to share this information <laughs> with your community, we are more than happy to do that. Um, like I said, we're going to have the, the four-part series coming in Flathead Valley Community College next spring. Did I mention that? I didn't. Sorry, I was, I, me I mentioned that at a different something earlier today. <laughs> but yeah, we are hosting a four-part um, wildfire in the Flathead series. It'll start, um, it's like, it'll be in your Flathead Valley Community College, the community ed brochure that they send out. <laughs> it'll be in there. Um, so it's, um, it's like the history of fire in the Flathead. I think the last Thursday evening in February, and then the and then the next three Thursdays in the beginning of March. So we'll talk about. Um, I don't know, Dan. You'll probably be there. Uh, maybe talking about some DNRC forest policy. We'll have the um, forest management policy between the Flathead National Forest, the county, the state. We're just going to open up discussion. That's one evening. Another, like I said, is is uh, fire history in the Flathead, and we'll wrap it up with something similar to this, sort of the what can you do to prepare in your home and your property. So we're going to have different different events, series coming up. Um, we just you're more than welcome to get involved. I encourage you to to stay involved. That's all, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for being here tonight. This is a good good night. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.